The meeting of the May 8, 2013 Ascension Parish Planning Commission will now come to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, please note uh, that uh, Mr. Robert Burgess, Commissioner, is not present and all other Commissioners are present. <coughs> please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, at that, this time, we'd like for staff members to introduce themselves. Stacy Webb, Secretary for Planning and Development. Lindsay Manda, Legal Counsel for the Planning Commission. Ricky Compton, Planning and Development Director. Michael Petty, Parish Planner. Lance Brock, Zoning Official. Tim Ward, Engineering. LeBaron Bourgeois, Building Official. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work that you do for the parish. Uh, agenda item number five, uh, Chairman's comments. As I have no comments at this time. Uh, number six, public comment. This is for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, that aren't open for a public hearing. Uh, they're limited to one three-minute comment per person. Uh, Madam Secretary, has anyone put in a card? Okay, thank you. Uh, number seven, approval or denial of the minutes of the April 10th, 2013 Planning Commission meeting. Uh, what Mr. is your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, there's one correction uh, to the minutes. The staff has corrected the minutes, but they don't show in your copy. It's on page six of the minutes under commission action. Uh, just uh, changing it to read. Uh, where the word unanimously is taken out and the word continent is changed to contingent and that's been corrected in the uh, in the formal minutes. So with those corrections, I'll uh, recommend approval. Okay, so it's been moved uh, by Mr. Chavisi. Second. Uh, second by Mr. Ori uh, that we approve the minutes as, uh, as corrected. Uh, any questions, discussions? Any objections? Okay, the minutes stand approved. <coughs> Uh, agenda item number eight, a public hearing to approve or deny the following family partitions. A, uh, the Lolita C. Nakati property, lot C1A and C1B. Uh, Mr. Quintmar. Good evening. Asking for Planning Commission approval of the following family partition, subdivision of lot C1 into C1A and C1B. Okay. And I see here that uh, the staff has recommended approval. Uh, yep. Any questions from commissioners? Okay. This does require a um, public comment period. Uh, so I'll now open the, okay, well, we need a motion to have a public comment period. So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Uh, unless there's any objection, we will open the public comment. Do we have any, uh, any cards on this? So we need a motion. Motion to close, Mr. Chair. Second? I'm second. Though. Okay, the, uh, the public comment uh, is closed. Help me on standing partition item number eight. Is that on the old hickory? No. Okay. no. Um, and if, if you'd like to make a comment, uh, please come up and put a card right now so we'll, we'll uh, recognize you when the time comes. Okay, so uh, for agenda item 8A, what is your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve as uh, presented. Second. Uh, moved by Mr. Nizo, second by Mr. Callender. Any questions, discussions? Any objections? Okay, the motion stands approved. Uh, next <coughs> item is uh, 8B, Chester G Diaz, Jr. Property, lots C, J, A, and D. Mr. Quintma. Okay. It's another uh, <clears throat> family partition to subdivide lot CJ into CJA and uh, lot D. And it's named lot D because of the previous divisions um, south of the property A, B1, and C. Okay, and again, I, I see that the staff recommends approval and they requested elimination of the T turnaround and that was no problem. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, the applicant also uh, is requesting a variance um, that uh, did not make the write up but um, that the 12-foot utility servitude uh, be included within the 60-foot private access servitude. Um, I'm sure Mr. Uh, Quitmont can uh, explain the, the history of this, but basically what it amounts to is over a period of uh, various divisions, the access servitude was 60 feet, required to be 60 feet in places with a 12-foot in addition, and then um, 
Uh, it was uh, at one point the 12 foot utility servitude could be included within the 60 feet and then they um, uh, the previous commission allowed or would not allow the 12 foot utility servitude to be included within that so the reduction of the servitude went from 60 to 48 feet to take the 12 foot outside of it we're we're uh, the, the kind of the the gist of what we're doing here is we're making it 60 feet all the way from the start to the end of the private access servitude and allowing the 12 foot utility servitude to once again be inside <coughs> that that access servitude okay. <clears throat> uh, any questions from commissioners okay uh, again we'll need to put open the public hearing I'll move to open them. Mr. Chavisi moves second second uh, Mr. Nizo any objection okay we'll open the public hearing do we have a card on this one <coughs> then let's close the public hearing. So moved. Mr. Second. Tavisi, Mr. Nizo, we'll close the public hearing. Um, now, what is your pleasure for item 8B? I move that we approve it. Uh, Mr. Bishop moves that we approve. Second, Second by Mr. Callender. Um, any questions, discussions? Any objection? Okay, the motion is approved. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda brings us to agenda item number 9. Public hearing to recommend approval or denial to the Parish Council of the following servitude re revocations. The first one, A, is the Delane Martinez property, lots 4A1, 4B1, 4C, 4D, and 4E, Panama Manor Drive. Uh, petition was, was put in by Delaney uh, Martinez <coughs> Boudreau. Uh, okay, would you identify yourself, please? I'm Delaine Martinez Boudreau. Okay. okay, and uh, explain what you're asking for here. Um, on some property that I own, we had a private road that was Utopia Lane that was on the paper. And after my ex husband and I divorced, I got the property and I have. The road is now adjacent to the one that was on the paper on the original map. When we originally had bought the property, it, it we built the house. When we were building the house, the um, surveyor had to do the division, and they put the Utopia Lane on the map as just a formality. It's never been used as a road and we want to take that off of the map because we use the one the Panama Manor Drive which is adjacent to it that is actually where the road is okay. there's never been any road where the utopia is okay uh, and I see in our information that uh, there was no objection from any utility company no objection from the drainage department <coughs> Uh, well, questions? I, yeah, question to, for the staff. Um, mm -hmm. The request was to revoke the 40 foot access servitude and the 10 foot utility servitude and modify the 35 foot building line. The, the no objection offered by the engineering department is only to revoke the 10 foot servitude. What about the other issue matters? So um, the engineering department uh, looked at the utility servitude. Um, as uh, I guess their portion of this the access <coughs> servitude um, becomes an issue are, are we still providing access to the lots and so uh, I think they they saw that as more of a planning comment to address uh, revoking a, a private access servitude um, and you know I guess allowed us to make the judgment call as to whether access was being granted or not mm -hmm. um, so that that's the reason why um, they didn't the the building line itself doesn't necessarily have to be spelled out necessarily through this revocation process because just by virtue of eliminating the utility servitude and the access servitude the building line is automatically going to modify itself when those are no longer obstructing its ability to be the, the standard setback um, I will mention, uh, as far as the letters received, um, we did not receive a letter from Entergy, uh, from Cox, or from Atmos. 
Um, it's not uncommon that we do not receive letters from certain utility companies. Um, how, how are they notified, uh, uh, Mike? Uh, through the application, by the applicant, the applicant is required to submit a letter to the addresses that the utility companies have provided us is where, you know, to, to send requests such as this. Uh, certified uh, or um, just we don't, a regular We letter? don't require it to okay. be certified. Uh, and then uh, the applicant, uh, when, when they submit the application, is supposed to submit at the same time all of those letters. Uh, however, um, in this situation, uh, I think uh, Ms. They, Martinez. Excuse me. They were sent certified. I uh -huh. had an attorney, Christian Avery, had handled all of that. Okay. And he returned the ones that were never um, signed for. And mm -hmm. Entergy, the power is actually on the other side of the property where Entergy, Cox, and Etail come in on the um, ditch side that borders the Moran subdivision. That's where those utilities come in. And on the road, Utop uh, Panama <coughs> Manor, we have servitude for utilities on that road. We have a mm -hmm. total of 60 foot on that one. And I have a revised map that was just filed last uh, month. Yeah, what, what I was going to add is, is Ms. Martinez had an attorney do the process for her that actually began before our servitude revocation process was, was uh, accepted by the council as, as mm -hmm. the new process. And so um, I, I was going to ask her to explain if, if Entergy provides power for the site, it, it may be because it wasn't actually, you know, within that servitude or whatever, <coughs> they just didn't respond. Um, but... Um, the scenario is, 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 I guess, the way that she described it. The 60-foot uh, Panama Manor Drive includes our now 12-foot utility servitude um, adjacent to it. So, um, you know, as far as the planning perspective, we don't see an issue uh, as long as the utility companies <coughs> don't have, you know, utilities within that servitude. The access servitude can go away because it's being provided elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And it's kind of vague when it says modify the 35-foot <coughs> building line. What specifically is, is going to be modified? Like I said, it, that, that kind of comes with the process. So it's 35 um, feet from the center of the uh, road? It, it's, it's, um, it would actually um, drop to a 25-foot a front setback, which is what's required by the zoning. Okay. Um, that, that actually, like I said, by virtue of eliminating the utility <coughs> servitude, by virtue of eliminating the access servitude, the building setback then becomes um, the, the typical scenario of the lot line and you have a 25-foot front setback. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the intent all along for doing all of this is there's uh, an existing mobile home on lot 4B1 and an existing home on 4A1 that are, in, that are actually encroaching the existing 10-foot utility servitude as well as uh, 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 the, the mobile home is actually encroaching part of the access <coughs> survey. It's to clear up a uh, some, some issues with that. Okay. And uh, I, I think it's just an, uh, the issue is it's just cleaning up uh, some things that have been done in the past. So staff has no problem with this uh, request? Staff sees no issues okay. with it. Any other questions? Okay, this also does require <coughs> a public hearing. Move we open the uh, public hearing. <coughs> second. Second. Any objections? Okay, let's open up the public hearing. Are there any cards? No. Okay. So we'll need to close the public hearing. <coughs> Move. Okay. S second. Second. All right. Uh, it, we'll close the public hearing. Okay, so uh, then the what we have is uh, <coughs> a request to uh, for the servitude re revocation item 9A. What do you, what's your pleasure? Move for approval. Mr. Second. Keller moves. We're um, recommending this to the council. For yeah, we'll recommend to the council. Second by Mr. Bishop. Uh, any questions, discussions, any objection? Okay, motion carries. We will recommend approval to the parish council. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is 9B, and this is a <coughs> public hearing to recommend approval of denial of this servitude revocation. The parent partition lot 1 F1 B1 39319 Tommy Moore Road. Uh, applicant is Mr. Michael E. Pa it is, but I am not Michael Powers. Okay. <laughs> Please identify I, yourself. I am Ashley Lambeth 
I am the daughter of the owner of that piece of property, uh -huh. and I will be opening a business on that property. Michael Powers is our architect. Okay. And we are asking for the drainage servitude to be revoked because we have to put a water retention pond on that property, and it will actually be on that servitude. Okay. <coughs> And this is a drainage servitude, so the only letter we needed was from the drainage department. That is correct. Engineering it, department. It, it wasn't a generic servitude. It was specifically spelled out for drainage. Um, uh -huh. It is the, the drainage plan for the development that requires the pond to be, um, to be built, and in order to build it, um, that, that is the location of the site where it needs to fall. Um, it's an issue where uh, drainage will now be provided by the pond, so the servitude is, is no longer necessary, and so okay. it, it's just a matter of getting rid of it so they can they can complete their construction. Okay. Uh, Still questions? being used for drainage. What's that? Still being used for drainage, so exactly. Right. You're not worried about access to it because of the private exactly property okay. arrangement. Any other questions? Okay, let's open up a public hearing on this one. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, any objections? Public hearing is open. We do have a card on this. Okay. Close. Move to close. Second. Okay, so we'll close the, uh, the public hearing. So for item 9B, uh, what's your pleasure? I move that we approve. Mr. Mori, approval Mr. Mori um, moves that we approve. Second. Second by Mr. Callender. Any uh, questions, discussions? Any objection? Okay, hearing none, the motion stands approved. That we will recommend that for, to the Parish <coughs> Council for approval. Thank you. Thank you. And item 9C, <coughs> servitude revocation, Pelican Crossing, second filing, lot 67. Myron and Wilman, is it Pervu? Pervu, yes, Pervu. sir. Okay. And Mary and Pervu. Okay. Okay, uh, tell us what you're requesting here. Well, we uh, request the revocation of the 25 foot uh, drainage servitude on the side of uh, the property. Okay. <coughs> and this is a drainage servitude, and we have a letter from um, the engineering department, no objection to revoking the servitude. Uh, questions of commissioners? Okay. Um, public hearing? So moved. We open the public Second. hearing. Second. Second. Okay, we'll open the public hearing unless there's an objection. Uh, any cards on this one? Okay. Close the public hearing. So move. Okay. Josh? Second? Second. All right. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to come up with an easier process <laughs> for opening and closing <laughs> public hearings. Uh, okay, so for ni uh, 9C, this revocation, what's your pleasure, gentlemen? Mr. Second. Uh, Mr. Callender moves. Mr. Bishop seconds. Uh, any questions, discussions? Any objection? Okay, so that motion carries, and we will make that recommendation also to the council. Thank you for coming. Okay, that brings us to item 10, staff report. So last month we talked a little bit about some ideas that we've been working on for revisions to the subdivision regulations. And um, one of the directions that you guys gave us was to go out and find some real-world examples. And so Mike and I have been doing some research, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, it has been difficult to find exact replicas of what we're talking about. There's a lot of examples of subdivisions that mix housing types. There's a lot of examples of subdivisions that provide open space and sidewalks and street trees. Um, but most of those subdivisions don't do all of the things that we're talking about. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about this week was, or this month, is if you've had a chance to go through the list um, so that maybe we can bounce some of these ideas back and forth of which of these ideas do we think are, are, are very sticky and we want to continue moving forward with, which ones um, did the mud maybe not stick on the wall as well, and we want to maybe put that on a back burner and come back to it after we've worked some of these, these demons out of the system. Um, and so I think that's where I'd like to start, is just going down the list. Um, and, and real briefly, we don't need to spend an inordinate amount of time on each item, but if any of you had any 
thoughts, ideas, comments, concerns, if you've been talking to friends or, or um, other consultants about these ideas, let's, let's try to get some of these ideas out in the open. So the first idea about uh, density and how it's going to be calculated, are there any thoughts on that? And how is that different from what we currently do as far as calculating the density? So currently a developer comes to the parish with a, a site that may be, let's just use nice round numbers, it may be 100 acres. That 100 acres may have some wetlands, it may have a water body or a bayou or a utility servitude. Uh, it may be encumbered with some part of a right-of-way. But today that developer is able to count all 100 acres towards the number of units that they're allowed to put on that piece of property and this language simply says that we're going to need you to remove out or subtract out those parts of the property that aren't physically developable and today the language says pipeline servitudes right-of-ways existing road right-of-ways existing drainage <coughs> servitudes wetlands and existing water bodies so removing those from the gross side area to determine what your net developable area is for the piece of property and then multiplying the allowed density based on the underlying zoning to get to the number of units. Okay. But we had the thought mm -hmm. that if the property were accessible by trails or, or were somehow added to the amenity of the, of the development that we would count some portion of it. Right. Sure. We need to come to a, a number. Um, the examples that I've been able to locate, basically when there's a requirement for <coughs> parks or open space, you can then count those parts of the land if they amenitize it, right. uh, but it's not physically developable for residential. Uh, wetlands, for example, right? Or yes, sir. Right-of-ways, certain right-of-ways? Well, pipeline servitudes or right-of-ways basically you can't build anything in them and we're not going to allow those to be counted to parks I mean although just the view of a, a pretty wetland has some value sure so I think you ought to calculate that into it some way also <coughs> you know even though it's not buildable and you can't actually walk on it but if you I don't know it seems like if somebody has 20 acres and 10 of its wetlands that somehow, you know, it wouldn't increase the parishes or that area's density so much by having houses, more houses on the buildable part uh, because, you know, the whole area is, won't have, <coughs> be very dense if you calculate it, you know, the, 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 the viewable part. Right. Well, I mean, in that situation, you've got 10 acres of developable land at our highest density, which is three units an acre. So that's 30 units. What you're trying to say, it sounds like, is that some other portion of that 10 acres of wetland, you should allow them to count towards the density. So allow them to get more than 30 units on that 10 acres. I think that's what I am saying. And so the question is, is you're increasing the what we're calling the net density above what's allowed by the underlying zoning and so where's the happy place for that do you allow them to get to three and a half units per acre do you allow them to get to four units per acre on the net developable i don't know the answer to that right Ricky, because what what that's going to do is in essence increase the density or the carrying capacity of what's what's within left within that development but but not in the parish as a whole because if you could build on all of it, you would have been able to build on the, the wetlands. So within, <clears throat> within that 20 acres, you wouldn't have any more houses <coughs> than you would have had within the 20 acres if you could have built on all of it. I mean, sure, the, it, there's a cost to build on wetlands, and that cost is a mitigation cost, and they can... Well, I'm not suggesting that you would build <coughs> on the wetlands. I'm just saying that in calculating the density. Right. So you would, could you, in this case, the 10 acres that you would have, that would be wetlands, could you use that towards green space to where you'd be able to fully utilize the remaining 10 acres? 
could that ten acres? The argument was it? going to be that you're going to have a required acreage for open space in a subdivision of that size, and a 30 lot subdivision that is going to be a very small acreage. But what we were writing was that 50 percent of that very small acreage has to be upland. It has to be a place where you can actually recreate. And all I was suggesting is that recreating by viewing it has some value, even if you can't walk on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't build a sidewalk on it. You yeah. from, the, from, the, from the planning perspective, <coughs> that is sold in, uh, in upcharges on those lots. Mm -hmm. Because if, you can't, if every single lot can't get to that wetland, and every single lot doesn't have a view of that wetland, then it's not open to every single lot. Mm -hmm. You're going to back lots up to that wetland. And so you're saying that because those, let's just say half of them, 15 of those 30 lots can see it, they can count extra density because of it. And from a planning perspective, I'm going to tell you that if every lot doesn't have access to it, it doesn't count. Because you've privatized that thing. Well, Ricky, if we're talking about the, the, the idea behind why, why we have a density anyway, is it to make sure the lots are big enough or is it to control the total population in a region? There's got to be a reason to have a density rule. It's the way they painted the map. I mean, the, it, it wasn't logical when they did it the first time, okay. but we're stuck with it. So we've got this large area of our parish that's been granted three units per acre, <clears throat> and there was no logic when that was done. And so to ask me w why we would hold them to it now you know, it's to me, we have to say why. The, the land can't carry that many units. The infrastructure that we have can't carry that many units. We're trying to allow them to build smaller units to get closer to that number, but I don't know that we should over-densify the property because that property is straddled with wetlands or water. Yeah. Now, what I'm saying is it's not really over... not over-densifying it. It's just... <coughs> concentrating the density on a smaller part of it. That's what this the would The overall eliminate. density in the, within the 20 acres is not affected. If they're all built high on one acre, are they spread out over it? It's the same amount of people on the 20 acres. <coughs> right, but I'm telling you physically can't build on those other 10 acres. I understand that. I was just <coughs> using a... Right. It, it's to an urban context because when you start to... to take those other 10 acres, it's sort of a transfer of development rights. You're saying that I'm going to transfer those 10 acres that I physically can't develop onto the 10 acres that I can develop. That percentage needs to be either very, very low so that you don't encourage people with big tracts of wetland to then, if I've got 100 acres and 90 acres are wetland, I've only got 10 acres, but now all of a sudden I can build 300 lots on 10 acres. But I mean, we've discussed mm -hmm. before where minimum lot size is like our fail safe. 10,500 square foot, that's our fail safe for not allowing it to be shifted to that 10 acres. We're going a lot lower than that with this code. We're going a lot lower than 10,500. How so? By allowing smaller By lots. By doing the net density. That's, that's kind of in the next but, couple of sections when they okay. have a variance in the, in the, uh, the size of the lots. Is that correct? <clears throat> right. Our current smallest lot is a 70 by 150, plus or minus. The tables, which haven't been included in the last couple of packets because they were in the first set, you get down to a 50 by 110, 50 by 120. I mean, we're going to getting to a much smaller lot. So we're allowing, the, we're exchanging the smaller lot and the increased density, but we're saying if the land's not buildable, you can't calculate it for your density. Okay. Ricky, um... I know that you've done a lot of research on this and you found some examples of some things we're trying to demonstrate here and in some areas. Uh, and I, I, I'd hate to think that we're uh, looking at reinventing the wheel. I, I, there, there is probably something out there like this. Or, or we're, we're, we're taking the good aspects of several different examples and sort of compiling them. Uh, which, which might be a good thing. I mean, we're learning from others. We're not trying to invent something and then and, and figuring out if it's going to work or not. We really do want to understand whether this work, this concept works in other areas. That's why we you know, I kind of insisted that we look for, <coughs> for other areas. And I still, I still hope that we continue to try to 
to look uh, for something like this or to, as you're doing now, take uh, the best aspects of, of other developments and try to incorporate them into some unified plan. Uh, but in the end, it's going to be whether this concept sells or not. It, it all comes to, sort of comes down to money in, in terms <coughs> of the developers. Are we, is a developer going to look at this in the end and say, I can do as well or better with this sort of development and the people will, will buy and accept this uh, than I could do with, with the traditional development we've seen in Ascension Parish. It kind of comes down to that. So have we talked to developers in the area? I know we've probably talked to a couple. Some have given their comments back to us, but we haven't done that sort of outreach, really. No, no not yet. Not I mean, yet. still hammering out we're the not, details. Yeah, we're not to that point yet, but that, that is part of the, the idea. Because we want to we wanna get that their input and, and uh, you know, how they're going to how they're going to react to this? I mean, I can tell you just off the top of my head, they're going to react negatively. Well, and because any time you change the rules, mm -hmm. and the rules appear to be more complicated, then yes, they're going to be against it. the The idea of pulling from other parts of other codes, I mean, I'm I'm going to be sort of brutally honest. The reason most of our subdivisions are the way they are is because base zoning and the base subdivision code allows them to. When you go to other parts of the country where you see more interesting subdivision design, it's because their base zoning does not allow it. They have to do something different to develop the, to the intensity or, or, or density that they want, mm -hmm. which typically requires the PUD, the SPUDs, the TNDs, the, the interesting projects. And so <clears throat> what we are trying to do is say, what if all subdivisions in Ascension Parish had to do something better than what's always been done. And so the first things that are from a planning perspective that we're going to look for is parks and open space, sidewalks and street trees. And so if I'm going to ask a developer to provide those things that actually create a place, what can I give them? I can give them smaller lots, right. which is going to increase their density. The question, though, is where do you cap it? And if I'm capping it at net developable, that is the national standard. Determine how much of the property can be built on, and that's the density you can get to. If you don't get anywhere close to your base density, well, then that's the fault of the property you purchased mm -hmm. because that property is not developable. I think when we first talked about this, you took a, a standard, let's call it a standard subdivision in the area, and, and you took that density, and then you played with that, and, and made it look more like this concept of different lot sizes and all. And came up with the same density in the end, didn't you? For the pro, for the whole development. I came up with a higher density. <coughs> a higher density. More lots. More lots. Right? More yeah. lots. I, I mean, that, that's, that should be an attractive thing. Um, I, all, all I'm saying is that I'm, I, I support us going forward with this. But practically speaking, in the end, it's got to sell both to the residents of the parish, people who want to move into the parish and want to, and want to live in a, in a subdivision like this. Now, I live in a subdivision on a lake. I love the lake and all that, but um, my house is on a lake. Not all the houses are in, in subdivision on a lake. We have no sidewalks. We have no other green space uh, other than the lake behind my house, and, and I would much prefer to have something like this with sidewalks and, and some other park space or green space. So um, personally, I love it. Uh, whether or not it's going to pass the, you know, the, the test of time. And, okay. and but unfortunately, the only, way to, here. the only way to test it is to let no, it fail I, on its own, I guess, and I build one. No, right? I, think I, mean, I, I think we're doing the right thing. I think we're trying to learn from right. other areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think and, ultimately, okay. if we can come to the rules that we want all subdivisions to follow mm -hmm. and the <coughs> development community doesn't like those rules, then what that means is every development that comes forward will have to be a PUD, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because that means they get to write their own rules. And then we can determine if we like the rules that they're crafting based on this standard that we've established for the subdivisions we want to see. And if what they do says, well, we don't necessarily want to do 50% of uh, max of one lot size, then you guys can decide when that PUD's approved, okay, we'll allow 100% of all one lot size. Do you want to allow longer block lengths? Do you want to allow, you know, which things from our subdivision code are you going to allow them to not do? 
And if we just we determine over time that all we're seeing are PUDs because they don't like this, that, or the other rule, then yeah, we can go back and amend the subdivision code to take out those things that are offensive to the development community. But I don't know that planning for appeasing the development community when you're revising the rules is going to solve the problem that we're seeing is subdivisions that don't, there's no there there. They're just Places for houses. I don't think we're talking about appeasing the development community, but I think we're talking about not driving them away. You know, we've got to at least offer a, a, a solution that's going to allow a developer to to continue to make money and do well here. There, there, we're going to have more development here in Ascension Parish, whether we we can either plan for it or not plan for it. We're going to have more development. There's going to be a lot of of uh, yes. expansion here, and a lot more yeah. people are going to want to. And, move and people will come for other reasons <laughs> other than our well, development code. And whatever our development code is, they're going to come. I, I was I in a lot of that. master plan meetings where a lot of people said, we don't want another 100,000 people in this parish. And if our development code is one of the reasons why they don't come, well, I don't necessarily have a problem with that because that means that the ones that do come, the communities are going to be better. I, I just don't have a problem with development slowing down, but it's better. Interesting take. <clears throat> all right. Uh, the next four or five paragraphs all have to do with the, the mixture of, of lot sizes and, and things such as that. And I think we've talked about that already. Are there any? Well, okay. So the argument that I've heard from the development community is we don't want to do that. We want to just build the one house size in our subdivisions. And we don't want you telling us that we have to build different house sizes. And our argument is we're not telling you to build different house sizes we're telling you to put different lot sizes in if the community that's coming in to buy in that development says we want the same narrow house that you're building on the 50 on the 70 well then that's up to you as the builder to decide but then once again as we debated it amongst the three of us here we said well is that are those the things that we start to eliminate do we eliminate the the max number of units in a subdivision that are one lot size do we eliminate the three different lot widths from a subdivision do we eliminate no more than 20 lots of a single housing can be together or clumped together because you know in the examples we've seen that's that's the standard we're going to put all of our 50s because those people can't afford to buy a 60 foot lot we're going to put them over here and segregate them we're going to take our 60s there's our middle and we're going to put them here and all of our our muckety mucks our 70s and 80s we're going to put over here and we segregate these houses and what we're saying is we want them to mix blend those houses together so that as those communities develop and evolve over time you do have that mix and you you do have that the pattern that doesn't repeat itself but it's sort of a random hodgepodge or a potpourri if you will of houses in there you know that's something that we need to decide is it is it important do we want to trade that off and say it's not important okay uh, next item we see is uh, street interconnectivity and I'm sure that will uh, attract some interest from the commission from well from the public I think <laughs> from the commission um, and of course uh, when people move into a subdivision they want that subdivision to be a private place and only accessible by the people within the subdivision uh, the, the providers of, say, school bus service and ambulances and, and, and other service vehicles uh, want to be able to access from one subdivision to the other because uh, it, uh, the, the traffic in so many of our main arteries is, is so congested that it's very hard for them to get in and out of adjacent subdivisions. So that is uh, the issue to be debated, right? Yes, sir. And you know you, you'll hear it amongst your peers and you'll hear it amongst the community that I live in a subdivision that I don't care if it was planned to have four exits we like the one exit we have we like the two exits we have we don't want those other streets tying into any future houses um, and so don't tie us in and from planner speak I'm gonna argue that point is the garbage the school bus the police the the fire those guys like to have multiple routes. They, might, they like to have ways to get in and out of subdivisions in case there's accidents or other things. And I don't even know how to write the language to say, well, you can do it, but you don't have to. It's either you do it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I just don't know that there's a happy medium. The, the argument's going to be, well, what if the new community doesn't want to tie into the old community? Well, I don't know that you allow them to make that call, but what if the old community doesn't want the new community to tie into it? Well, then do you require a percentage? Do you require a, a majority? Do you I mean, how do you decide whether or not you allow them to connect or force them to connect one way or the other? Yeah. Ricky, uh, <clears throat> on some of the statements you just made, at our last meeting, uh, one of your suggestions was to put your pin to this idea and, and get some feedback, and, and I did exactly that, especially on this connectivity issue. And, and some of the answers that I received were uh, on the lines of, well, you're going to change the subdivision development code. You need to plan for the buses and the police and the fire to have access to it without the connectivity. You have that option. Uh, some of the feedback I got was, uh, I don't have a problem with interconnectivity within the same development phases or, or, or uh, plans, uh, but my problem is I don't want to be connected to a subdivision that doesn't have a homeowners association that requires the exact same or close to the same regulations that we do. I don't want to be connected to a subdivision that has, doesn't have the same amenities that we do. Uh, or, or uh, you know, I make a major investment when I buy my home and five years, ten years down the road, I find out uh, my subdivision is going to be tied into a subdivision that doesn't require the same uh, homeowners association rules, doesn't have the same value, property value or home values uh, because it's a, a different type of development. And, and that's the concern. And when I say, well, you know, you got to consider the fact that we need to make it accessible to the safety and the emergency units and school bus transportation, well, you have that power. With your new development code, make them accessible. Does it have to be through from one subdivision to another? And to give you even a further statement that I got was the fact that they're not so concerned about if this new developmental code is put in place because then all the subdivisions will meet the same codes and they have no problem with it. So the, the future development is not in question. It's what about the ones that are already in place? Uh, example I got was you've had at least eight to a dozen locations where connectivity was put in place and then changed. Evidently, the wow. connectivity is not something that they want or it's not working the way it was intended to work. <laughs> So that's some of the feedback I got, and, and, and so I think uh, overall what I was told was to just say where feasible is too vague of a way to explain it. We need some definition better on how you're going to determine where it's really something that's valuable and needed, and not just the fact whether it's feasible. Feasible to who? The, the, the one side of the subdivision the other side of the subdivision? Feasible to the parish and maybe not to the homeowners? So I think we need to do a little bit more work on that. I'm not going to say connectivity can't work and shouldn't work in some cases, but from the feedback I got, there's a whole lot of questions about how do you determine where it's really feasible and where can we do it without connectivity, with the development. So that's just some of the thoughts that I got from the public when I talked with them since last meeting. Okay. Any other comments about that? We can go into a few more of these items. I don't know that we can cover the whole deal because we've got another meeting after this. Um, we'll talk maybe about uh, sidewalks and, and, and parks. I don't think that the, uh, any residents would object to sidewalks in a subdivision. In fact, I wish my subdivision had sidewalks. Um, and it, it does have some nice green space, and I like that, and I, I think that's valuable too. Uh, so I, I, don't know that uh, we'd get a whole lot of objection from the general public on that. Yeah, the, the one comment I got from a developer was that there can be a more permanent non-paved trail section. And so what they're going to do is get me their cross-section for how that is developed. It involved several layers of compaction and then some other layers of stone and whatnot and, yeah. and, and a a trim, a railing that keeps it all contained. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. you know, the, the idea of only paved trails was because right. all the trails that have been built wash out after a year. 
But if we get something that's a more permanent yeah. non-paved trail, then I, I'm open to that idea. So and that may be more attractive <coughs> than, a, than a, a concrete uh, path as well. Okay. And maybe we can talk about the trees at this point, our requirements. Again, I don't know that people would object <coughs> unless there's some problem that the trees would cause. You know, the, the, the greenway or the parkway is that area between the back of curb and the sidewalk. And so when we start talking about our local street cross section, that parkway is where we would ideally want to plant those street trees. How wide is that? Well, ideally, it would be eight feet wide, and you put your tree right in the middle. Mm -hmm. So an eight-foot wide parkway on either side of the road is 16 feet. 24 feet of pavement and curb and gutter is 40 feet. You have five foot of sidewalk on each side, and that's a 50-foot cross section. So right now, I think our standard cross section is 50, but I don't believe the greenways are as big. I think our pavement section is bigger, so there's some give and take right that we could do in there and our a 24 foot with including the curb and gutter is narrower than we currently do because uh, your curb and gutter is about four feet two feet on either side so that's 20 feet of pavement and four feet of covering gutter so but an eight foot parkway is typically where you'd want to put a street tree with the street tree four foot from the back of curb and four <laughs> foot from the sidewalk sort of on that subject because you mentioned it um, curb and gutter <coughs> are we requiring curb and gutter that's required today. You can't build an open ditch subdivision in Ascension Parish anymore. Okay. Any other uh, questions or discussion about the, uh, the trees? Okay. The last item you have here is the amount of fill, and we've had some discussion over that. Um, uh, maybe we can leave that to another meeting because we've got uh, people here for the zoning meeting and we want to go ahead and uh, and do that. So let's uh, let's conclude the staff report at this point and we'll come back uh, next meeting and, and maybe address that issue in a few, revisit some of the other ones. <coughs> All right, agenda item number 11, an engineering staff report. Uh, yeah. The first thing on here is uh, we just want to revise the testing requirements. And uh, as you can see, the, um, we list out uh, what the requirements would change to. But basically, we're not uh, the requirements, we're not changing the requirements that have to be done on the compaction of the trenches. It's just that we've only require them to submit the reports to us for the mid and the and the top levels and now we want them submitted for every one foot uh, compaction uh, level they, they currently compact they're supposed to be compacting every foot we just want the reports mm -hmm. to show that they're doing it okay mm -hmm. and to make this happen we'd need an ordinance from the parish government for parish council uh, yeah. This will be a change. Uh, the, in the, the, th this will be a change to the uh, to, to our code. Okay. I had a question. Uh, Tim, th th this requirement of every foot. This is not something that's any different than what most most require. This. Uh, no. This that, is just that's a standard. A, that's a standard from the you know basically we followed the DOT. Right. Uh, a way to install the 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 sanitary sewer. We're just requesting the requesting reports it. actually be <laughs> submitted. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so this would take then a public hearing if we wanted it to. Yeah, yeah next month it'll come to a public hearing. So w what we need to do then at this meeting is uh, move to, to set up a, uh, on the agenda at next meeting a public hearing to uh, uh, discuss <coughs> and, and approve or not approve this proposed ordinance. Do I hear a motion I'll to do that? I'll make that motion, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Second. Uh, Mr. Bishop, any objection? Okay, so uh, we'd like to have that uh, placed on the agenda of the next meeting. All right, so that uh, brings us to the end of our agenda. Uh, motion to adjourn. Mr. Callender. 
Second. Uh, Mr. Horry. Let's adjourn. Okay, uh, our meeting is adjourned. We'll take about a five minute uh, break. We'll start the zoning meeting at five minutes to seven. I appreciate the patience of you people who came for the, uh, uh, for the zoning meeting. We'll start that in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>